Hi, everybody. I'm Heather, the STEM Services Manager from North Central Washington Libraries. And today I'm doing another interview with Esker, except we're switching it up a little bit this time. And she's actually going to be interviewing somebody. Um, so Esker has lived in Washington for the last three years, and she's often helped with the virtual STEM programs, and she's helped with in-person programs uh, before we entered into this um, weird virtual world we live in now. Um, but she loves to help with science and different programs and art programs, and she's in, in the healthcare field and, the, and a science educator. Um, so she's super passionate about connecting um, our community members with science and art through it, critical thinking and communication. And today we are going to be talking about petroglyphs and Esker is going to go ahead and introduce Chester Lavash and then they will take it from there. So go ahead, Esker. Thank you. Okay, thanks Heather. Hi. Um, so we're going to be talking in a bit um, with Dr. Chester Lavage. He's an archeologist from Mesa Prieta who um, uh, studies uh, and researches uh, in an area called uh, Mesa Prieta. Um, he has, um, he had gotten his, he has gotten his doctorate from um, studying an area in the Mojave Desert, um, studying petroglyphs and pictographs in that area. So first, um, before we begin, I wanted to talk a little bit about what rock art is. And uh, rock art is found all over the world. It was a means of communication uh, created by ancient and historic people. Um, they were communicating ideas and concepts. And uh, so there are different uh, forms, uh, different types. And so the two basic or the main types are pictographs and petroglyphs. And so I have examples here. Uh, the first is a pictograph from Horseshoe Canyon in uh, Canyonlands National Park. And this one, uh, if you can see it close, the darkened areas are the paintings. Uh, picto in Latin means to paint. And compare that to uh, petroglyph, both are forming images on rocks, uh, but petro means rock and glyph here means to engrave or carve. I don't know if you do that well. And so I have some examples behind me. Uh, these are examples from Washington state and they're from Columbia, uh, the Columbia River Basin. Uh, and these are petroglyphs uh, that are found at the Columbia Hills State Park on a trail called the Tamini Peshwa Trail, which means written on the rock. Um, and so for Washington residents, I would uh, encourage you to go out, explore, and uh, enjoy the areas that do have petroglyphs uh, and pictographs all over the state of Washington. Um, these here um, are from New Mexico, and this is the example I showed before. Uh, this is from Petroglyph National Monument west of Albuquerque, New Mexico. And these are from Mesa Prieta, and that's where Dr. Libash does his research. And so I sort of talked a little bit about what a petroglyph is. So Dr. Libash, can you tell us about your area and how uh, petroglyphs are made? All right. Um... Yeah, broadly, petroglyphs are made um, using what we call a pecking technique. Um, this is one of several techniques that are used, but that's uh, what's most often used. And uh, what that means is that they take um, a stone that's kind of chisel shaped and a stone that's a, a little bit beefier um, and use it as sort of a hammer and, and kind of peck it out like, like they're using a hammer and chisel to make all these little dots that make up the image. Now there are other ways to do this too. Um, you can scratch the surface. Um, you can actually cut into the surface a bit. Uh, that's called incising. It takes a, a, a lot more effort and we don't see a whole lot of incising uh, before the arrival of metal tools. Um, but we do see some, especially um, some historic ones. Uh, and then you have a braiding which is just sort of grinding the surface. Um, and so that'll create a, a, a very flat area, very smooth. You can kind of feel how smooth it is to the touch. Mm -hmm. So those are the basic ways in which petroglyphs are made. Mm -hmm. OK. 
can you, can you tell us a little bit about your area itself and um, mm -hmm. what you might find in that area? Yeah, um, so Mesa Prieta is in uh, northern New Mexico, and um, it's covered in uh, a very dark stone called basalt. So this is a volcanic rock. Uh, here we think it erupted somewhere around uh, 3.4 million years ago. Uh, and the basalt has this, um, has this unusual characteristic that uh, the longer it's exposed to the air and to weathering, um, it uh, develops uh, a sort of crust on the outside. Um, many rocks develop a crust like this called a patina, but when we see it on basalt in the desert, we call it a desert varnish. Um, and the desert varnish on basalt gets incredibly dark, uh, which makes it really great for making petroglyphs because anytime that you mark the surface, that mark is gonna show up very bright and it's going to stay bright for hundreds or even thousands of years. Um, you, you might notice actually on uh, some of the examples in the background that some of the marks are brighter than others. Um, some of this can be because uh, some of those, they really took their time pecking in and making the lines deep and bold. Uh, other times it's because uh, we see scratches which don't cut through the surface as much and so they're not going to be as bright and then also something that we see a lot is that just some of those petroglyphs are much much older so um, someone came in a few thousand years ago made a petroglyph whether they whether they pecked it in or whether they scratched it in or whether they they abraded it by by really grinding that surface and then over time, that desert varnish from the from the weathering starts to reform, and so the surface gets darker and darker and darker again. And then someone later on comes in and puts another petroglyph on top of that. Um, this is actually one of the ways that we can start to date petroglyphs. It's very hard to say exactly when a particular petroglyph was made. But uh, we do notice some changes over time in the types of uh, in the types of designs, the types of images that people made. And so, if we um, we really write down and and scrutinize um, all those different layers when when petroglyphs do overlap, we can start to say, "Hey, these designs." tend to be older, they've got more of that desert varnish, uh, so they're darker, they've got brighter petroglyphs on top of them, uh, and, and those brighter petroglyphs are different kinds of designs. And so, um, so we start to, to build that up and we can say that these designs tend to occur a bit later, these designs were made much earlier. Um, and and that's a lot of what we have at uh, Mesa Prieta, um, uh, especially later designs, designs that are uh, somewhere between um, 400 and 700 years old, which is still pretty old, right? Um, so that's like the, uh, the two examples on the top behind you. Uh, so, yeah. So those are done by ancestral Pueblo peoples. Um, they were um, they were the ancestors, the great 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 how many great grandparents of uh, Tewa people who are alive today. Um, and so, a lot of what we see are are those images, but then those are sometimes on top of um, and always brighter than uh, images kind of um, in the lower right. Here? Yeah, that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. so that's what we see from uh, a time uh, about 1,500 to um, uh, 7,000 years ago, which we call the archaic period. Um, and we do have archaic period images at Mesa Prieta, but those are older and they're always much darker. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, and then we have the, the image next to that, the, the two-horned serpent, 
we also have a lot of those as well. Okay. <laughs> and um, how long have you been uh, doing your research up in this area? So um, at Mesa Prieta, I, I've been here for about a year and a half. Mm -hmm. um, before that, I was doing research, as I said, in the Mojave Desert. So uh, the types of um, the types of rock art that we have out there are different. Um, we've got um, it's still mostly petroglyphs out there, but we do have a few pictographs. Um, one of the things about pictographs is um, before we had commercially made paints that you know are uh, specially designed to shed the rain and the water in that the types. Um, the, the types of um, paints that people would use would have to be made from natural sources and they would just wash off. Um, and so there probably used to be a lot more pictographs out there, pictographs being painted images. Um, there used to be a lot more out there than there are today. And it's simply that those don't last as long as petroglyphs unless they're somehow protected. So we'll see them in what we call a rock shelter. It's where you get an overhang of rock. It's not like, it's not a cave that you can crawl back into very far, but it, it's kind of protected. Um, so we'll see pictographs there. Um, we see lots of petroglyphs. We get petroglyphs that look a lot like, um, I was pointing out those archaic uh, images there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. The, geometric designs they're they're not animals or people um so we get uh, a lot more of those out there um but we still have some pictures of of animals especially animals that uh people felt were um very important for the world um so and and you've been studying and just to sort of regroup mm -hmm. you've been studying these for a while and so for our audience that maybe just get, be getting into it what is something um that you would uh, encourage them to look for or to think about when they go out to see these petroglyphs um <laughs> yeah looking for um if you're you're all if you already know where uh, kind of you're looking for them, um, you can find them in a lot of places. Um, and I think one of the most interesting things to start with is um, to see how dark they are, right? Like how much of that patina, how much of that desert varnish has come back and um, kind of think about like um, how much time has to pass for that because if someone 150 years ago made a petroglyph, it would be almost as bright today as it was when they made it. Um, so if you think um, that's what, um, not even 10 years after the Civil War, right? Um, and that would, be, that would be so bright, it would look basically new. Um, so when you see these um, starting to darken again, um, I think that's what really strikes me is that um, that starts to show that they're really old. Um, and you get, you get to really appreciate this uh, sort of depth of time. Um, another thing to look for is uh, if they're weathering or eroding. Um, now we, we discourage you from actually touching the surface because um, when you touch the petroglyph, um, you, can, you can damage the rock. Sometimes the rock isn't very stable and it'll flake off. Um, there's also oils on your fingers that can get into it. And um, that makes it difficult for scientists in the future. It also can change the color of the petroglyph. So we don't want you to actually touch it, but take a look at, um, especially when we have this peck images, like, can you see each little, each little peck mark or are they starting to smooth out? Um, so the older ones will, will start to erode from water and rain 
And, and you'll start to notice that, you know, where you used to have a, a nice crisp edge and, and crisp marks is starting to get rounded off. And that's, that's another thing that just like, it, it starts to give you a real appreciation for time and for, yeah. Did you, did you have anything else you wanted to add? Yeah, I mean, also look for patterns. Um, so that's exactly what we archaeologists like to do. Um, we like to look for things that, like, oh, I've seen that one before. Like, mm -hmm. do you always see these ones together? Um, uh, or are some of the petroglyphs very unique? Um, so... Yeah, try to think about, like, have you seen this before? Where did you see it before? And that's all kind of Im important. Um, some, of, some of the petroglyphs that we see, um, we think have more to them than just their images uh, based on some of those patterns of what it looks like and where it's found. Um, some of, many of you might be might have already seen a, uh, a flute player image, or you may have heard it called a Coco Pelli. Um, so when you see, when you see a picture of a flute player, um, that automatically, um, it automatically sort of references music, right? <laughs> so um, think about where you are and is this a space that would be good for performing music. Something that we're noticing at Mesa Prieta is in places where we find the flute players, we've also got pretty good echoes. Um, and this is, um, some of my research has been on uh, the acoustics or what does sound and echo do in uh, rock art sites. Um, so it's certainly true in the Mojave Desert. Um, it's certainly true for at least some of the stuff we have here uh, in the Southwest, uh, like at Mesa Prieta and, and other places, is that um, there are, uh, there's more rock art in places with um, really good echoes and really good sound for performing music. Um, some of the images we see here in, in those spaces, in, in those spaces where there's good echoes are different from the ones that we see in the Mojave and elsewhere, but we're still seeing that pattern of there's more rock art in these spaces, just like over there. Same thing, more rock art where, where there's good acoustics, where you can sing. And it's, uh, if you think about when you sing in the shower, right, it sounds a little bit better than when you're singing not in the shower, uh, because you're getting the echoes coming back. Right. Um, that's that's kind of what's going on. Um, and we think that uh, this actually made some of these places very special. That's amazing. Thank you, thank you. Um, I really appreciate your time. We appreciate your time. And it's uh, an incredible area of study and research and exploration for those, again, for our audience. Thank you so much. And thank you for the opportunity. I did have yeah. one question. I was um, yeah. I was wondering if you huh? had any advice for mm -hmm. just people going out to visit for the mm -hmm. first time. And this sounds maybe kind of funny to ask, but um, like, mm -hmm. should people be touching them or like, I don't know, like advice to keep petroglyphs safe and um, <laughs> yeah, right. uh, any advice? Uh, that's all I ask. Yeah, um, don't touch the petroglyphs. Um, if you can avoid touching them in any way, uh, don't touch them. Um, that doesn't mean that you can't appreciate them. Um, do take photos. Uh, photos are great. Um, and um, also be careful um, if you have things like trekking poles. Um, some trekking poles have metal tips on the end, and that can damage the rock. So um, be careful of that. Try to use one. Try to use trekking poles that don't have a metal tip or a wooden walking stick. So these aren't going to damage the rock as much. Um, or if you do have a, a, a metal trekking pole, just try to be careful of where you put it. Um, and then 
Okay, so those are some of the don'ts, right? And I'd say some of the do's are just kind of taking everything around. Like, you know, I talked about the the sound uh, of these spaces, right? Listen for echoes, but also look out. Like, what are the petroglyphs facing? What are they looking out onto? Um, that can be one of the other important things. They might be there because it was a good view. Um, so there's all sorts of reasons. And um, just take time with them. Just kind of take some time to be with uh, with the rock art and, and just kind of notice the surroundings that they're in. Well, thank you, Chester. Thank you, Esker. Um, I really appreciate your time. This has been super entertaining and educational.